Good evening, everyone, and thanks so much for joining us. My name is Lisa Deal, and I'm the Regional Coordinator for West Virginians for Affordable Healthcare. We, along with the West Virginia Citizen Action Education Fund and the West Virginia Center on Budget and Policy, want to welcome you to the West Virginia Healthcare for All Campaign's Kanawha County Candidate Forum. The West Virginia Healthcare for All Campaign has one overarching goal working to win the right to quality and affordable health care for all West Virginians. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Our moderator for tonight's candidate forum is Hunter Starks. So Hunter, if you want to go ahead and uh, take over. Thank you, Lisa. Um, hi, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our third of four Healthcare for All virtual candidate forum. Like Lisa said, my name is Hunter Starks. I'm the Kanawha County Coordinator for the Healthcare for All campaign. Before we get started, um, in honor of Indigenous Peoples Day, I would like to first recognize the tribes whose land we stand on today in Charleston, West Virginia. Uh, that includes the Osage, Cherokee, and Shawnee tribes. Uh, so um, today we will be hearing from seven candidates. Um, oh, sorry, we'll be hearing from five candidates from the Kanawha County area and statewide races. Uh, we have candidates from House District 35, uh, the gubernatorial race, and the attorney general race. And uh, before we jump into questions, we're going to take about a minute and allow each candidate to introduce themselves. You'll have to excuse my cat. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so first we have uh, Kathy Ferguson running for the House of Delegates in District 35. Kathy? Oh, Kathy, you are on mute. I'm so sorry. I thought I took myself off, not paying attention. Um, my name is Kathy Ferguson. I'm running for House of Delegates in the 35th District. So happy to be here with you all. Um, this is a very important issue um, and the stakes couldn't be higher this year as we head into election season. Um, healthcare for all is certainly something that West Virginia is going to benefit from um, in the short term. And of course, the long term when we look at, you know, at our children and what's in store for their future. And so I'm just happy to be here. Um, I hope you'll take an opportunity to go visit my website at Ferguson for Del Um, You can find me on Facebook at um, Kathy Ferguson for the People. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you all have. And I just look forward to getting into the meat of some of these issues. So thank you all. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, next, we're gonna hear from Rusty Williams, also running for, uh, for House of Delegates in District 35. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Uh, thanks again for allowing me to participate in this discussion. And um, I just want to say that this, to me, is the most uh, most important conversation that we could be having right now, especially with COVID and everything that's going on with the global pandemic that we're all trying to navigate right now. Um, but for me personally, this is all um, you know super important to me. Healthcare is the main reason that I got involved in the political process. It's the reason I decided to uh, sign my name and and seek office. I've experienced the uh, horrors of our for-profit healthcare system firsthand after being diagnosed with cancer and um, I had no insurance and no resources to pay. And uh, it was the most terrifying situation that I'd ever been in. Um, I understand how quickly people can go from, you know, happy, healthy lives, working, um, you know, everything going well to devastation and wondering where you're going to sleep at night and where your next meal is going to come from all because you made the mistake of getting sick in the richest uh, country in the history of the world. So to me, healthcare is the number one issue. And again, I just really appreciate the opportunity to take part in this forum and, and looking forward to answering any questions that you have. Thank you, Rusty. Next, we're gonna hear from uh, Kayla Young, also running for House of Delegates in District 35. Hi everybody, I'm Kayla Young. Uh, I'm running for House of Delegates in District 35, like Hunter just said, and I'm excited to be here and talk about healthcare. Uh, like Kathy and Rusty said, it couldn't be more important with COVID going on, but it was also the most important thing going on before COVID happened. So um, this is gonna be a great conversation. I think we're all on the same page with a lot of these issues and I'm really excited to get into it. Thank you, Kayla. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Sam Petzong. Sam is running for Attorney General. Are you able to hear me? Yes. All right. Well, I thank you all for doing this, for doing this work, each and every one of the candidates, the organizations that are gathered here. Uh, like Rusty, 
I'm in this race because of health care. Uh, I've got little family here that is having some health issues. So you'll see my kids who are with me. I'm helping to care for them tonight. Uh, you know, it's a good reminder that health care um, never escapes us. It's the one thing that can make or break our wealth building opportunities as families, as a state, as a people. I'm a type one diabetic. My children, my family has health issues we struggle with. And uh, you know that one in 10 West Virginians will lose their health insurance at a bare minimum. At least we're talking 200,000 people, coal miners, working people, mostly working people in West Virginia who have a state medical card or, or tax credits and subsidized health care today will lose it if Morrissey wins what he is after in the Supreme Court right now. I look forward to talking with you, and I, I am grateful for the forum and for the chance. Thank you, Sam. Uh, next, we have uh, Mr. Danny Lutz. He is the uh, Mountain Party gubernatorial candidate. Uh, Danny? Well, good evening, and again, thank you for uh, staging this forum for us. I'm Danny Lutz, and I'm kind of almost the odd one out because I was speaking to you from a farm in Jefferson County, part of which has been in the family since 1761. And as Sam just pointed out, health care and health issues are the great equalizer. There is no one so big no one so powerful that they can't be felled by a microbe or some other pathogen. And in West Virginia, we were hurt because we were not prepared to deal with pandemics. Later on in this presentation, I want to talk to you about my plan for being prepared to deal with future pandemics and disasters in the future. I just regret we couldn't have been as well prepared for this as I said, I grew up on this farm, and I like to tell people that I grew up so far back out in the sticks, we had to keep our own tomcat. And it was a good life. We never went hungry. But I remember people around me and the kids I went to school with often came to school without having had a meal of any kind. That's terrible. Now I see kids who come to school, they've had Coca-Cola, and cookies or sandwiches or something like that, not a, ho a wholesome meal for breakfast. Thank heaven we have the breakfast program and the nutrition programs in the schools. So I've just got up on my two minutes, and I look forward to discussing this issue further as we get along. Thank you kindly. Thank you so much, Danny, and uh, thank you to each and every candidate here tonight for taking the time out of your busy schedule to help talk health care with the people you wish to represent. Um, before we get started on question, I would just <clears throat> questions. I would just like to lay down some ground rules. Each candidate will receive one and a half minutes to answer each question. Um, the order in which candidates answer will change um, with each question. So candidates, stay sharp. And if you need a question repeated, uh, don't be shy to ask. Um, we're going to start first with questions for our candidates running um, for the West Virginia House of Delegates. Um, so our first question, uh, and this is going to go to Kathy Ferguson first. With West Virginians experiencing some of the poorest health out outcomes in the nation, what do you feel can be done to improve the long-term health picture for West Virginia families? What would be your priority areas? Okay. Well, um, definitely poverty is a prime social determinant of poor health outcomes. I think uh, most of us on here already know this. And when I look at the 35th district, I look at the expanse of it and the fact that it's very diverse um, in its makeup. And so you have some areas that are doing phenomenally well and have a lot of access, but you also have other areas that are affected um, disproportionately because of a stagnant economy, um, you know, lack of jobs, um, dollar food store economies. Um, we also have, you know, um, communities that are living on the fence line in terms of environmental contaminants. You know, so we've got chemical companies producing um, contaminants in our air and our water. We've already been through the crisis in our soil. And so all of these things, you know, collude together to create, you know, poor health com outcomes generally. So, um, you know, when I look at it in totality, you know, when we look at healthcare, all of it's very important and start to prioritize everything. But and, uh, certainly, I think my first, you know, um, druthers is to ensure a free and accessible healthcare in the immediate. That's number one. Um, but short of that, expanding Medicaid in a way that folks that fall in between the cracks 
in terms of their economic income, you know, and, and monies that they're receiving um, that are certainly, you know, often shut out, that they have access and that opportunity to buy into Medicaid. Um, I also, I think that they, we need to transition into green economies. I think that uh, it helps us with jobs um, and livable wages so that people can, can buy into a Medicaid expansion in that way. But also too, um, it will help us with our um, quality and environmental standards generally. Um, there's a lot of issues around ethylene oxide that's been in the news. And so these are the things that I feel very strongly about fighting. Um, looking at our DEP standards in terms of our quality um, standards, um, you know, addressing that, maybe making them more stringent, looking at our EPA rollbacks that happened during the COVID crises, you know, trying to restore some of those things because they're very important. Um, and then finally, looking at grant funding for underserved communities to advance health and wellness projects. I think those are um, really top priority for me going forward and, um, and I'll leave it there. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Uh, we have Rusty Williams, same question. Well, I think the, um, the answer is also included in the question. It's all a matter of priorities. For so long, uh, for at least as long as I can remember, we have sent folks to Charleston to represent us that have prioritized the bottom line profits of the extraction industries and of all the industries that have contributed to the poisoning of our communities here, rather than prioritizing the health and well being of the citizens they were elected to represent. And I think there's got to be a shift in the way we do things here. Um, we are one of the sickest states in the country, and I think that's got everything to do with the economics. When um, you know folks here are struggling to keep the roof over their head and food in the refrigerator, it's a natural reaction for people to reach out for anything that makes themselves feel better, and I think that is what's fueling the addiction epidemic that we're currently dealing with here. Um, there's a false narrative when we talk about addiction. Um, you know, we hear the opioid epidemic, and that's only a very small part of the problem. We have an addiction epidemic here, and it needs to be addressed. We're never going to, um, to have a healthy, thriving state until we address the economics. And I think we're gonna to have to address food security, um, you know, issues with housing, all of these things play into, into healthcare. And um, you know, we, we just need to prioritize our people. Thank you, Rusty. Uh, next we have Kayla Young, same question. Yeah, so, um... I know it's about healthcare, but like Kathy said, we also need to look at the other social determinants. We all know that if we don't have a strong environment, strong economic stability, strong education, all of these things, food security, we're never going to have good health care. It's all a huge part of it. You can't have success with one without the other. And we need this upward thinking, looking at the big picture to really solve the problem. Um, I think for a long time, our healthcare has been solved or tried to be solved um, without any data and without any evidence. It's been focusing on who can make the most money and that's insurance companies, that's extractive industries, that's big pharma, that's for-profit healthcare, which is a misnomer because it's wild to me. Um, I think the cost of healthcare is absolutely out of control and you know people shouldn't be making money off of this. It, it's people's health and lives and families and it shouldn't be about how rich we can get. It should be that everyone is healthy and safe and okay and everything just gets exacerbated by the cost. Um, so that's my number one priority is finding ways to lower the cost of health care. We have one of the oldest populations in the country and um, it's just so incredibly expensive for everyone. So I think we need to work on that. We need to work on the addiction crisis. We need to work on mental health. All of it's important. Thank you, Kayla. Um, we're gonna move on to our next question. Uh, we know that many women suffer from postpartum medical conditions that endanger both the woman and the child. Do you, do you support expanding Medicaid to cover postpartum people for up to 12 months at 300% of the poverty level? What else would you do to support the health of women and new parents? Um, we're gonna start with Rusty Williams. I absolutely support expanding um, expanding coverage to to cover a year postpartum. Uh, or, and I also, you know, it's important that we are the only industrialized nation on the earth where you know um, we're we're actually seeing a, a, a rise in the maternal mortality rate. You know that is that's unacceptable, and we're we're the richest country in the history of the world. So. 
from from what I, the information I've seen, um, expanding this coverage would only cost the state about a million dollars a year. Uh, if we can give sixty five million dollar tax coal or tax breaks to the coal industry, we can absolutely fund this. And I think that uh, another thing we need to look at to help West Virginia families, we need to look at child care and um, subsidizing or helping families with child care. The average family is paying about ten thousand four hundred dollars a year for daycare. And, um, you know, if we can ease that burden on families, um, you know, we're all going to be better off for it. Thank you, Rusty. Uh, Kayla? Yeah, this one hits home for me. Uh, I have two small kids and I almost died while giving birth to the first one. Um, I had moved back. I was on Medicaid, thankfully, so my coverage was paid for. And I wish everyone had that kind of coverage and didn't have to worry about the $10,000 bill they had to go along with their new expensive baby. Um, <laughs> It's wild to me. And like Rusty said, the maternal mortality rates rising, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, and we also, so yes, I do want to expand Medicaid to cover a year. Sorry. Yes, 100%. Um, I also think we need to do things like expand paid leave. Uh, FMLA is 12 weeks of unpaid. That's ridiculous. Um, people don't, they can't afford their life without getting paid. So we can't give them unpaid leave and they shouldn't have to use all their accrued paid time off because what happens when their baby has a cold or they have a cold or whatever it is, they should just be given paid time off to bond with their baby, take care of their own health, work on their mental health and make sure they're okay. And again, childcare is extremely important. It is so expensive. And if we're not setting families up and investing early on, on making sure that they're good to go, it's only going to cause problems later on down the line. Thank you, Kayla. Um, Kathy, same question. Okay, I, I feel like I don't even need to answer it because you had two great answers already, um, and I am in total alignment with them, but I will expound just a little bit and just say that in terms of, I'm not a parent, um, that's number one, and I have not been through, um, you know, having given a live birth but I will say that I can hearken back to a relative that had um, a newborn and had, you know, gone along in, for about a year um, in that child's development. And I happened to come across them in the wee hours of the morning. It was the dark of the evening and they were crying and I was very young and I, you know, it was immature. I really didn't understand what that was, but in retrospect, you know, as an adult, I've come to learn that that was postpartum depression um, more than likely. I just thought maybe she was just having, you know, a moment, um, you know, you just don't necessarily know. So we have a lot of folks that are making decisions about things that have no idea about the actual circumstances. So I think it's important to follow the science. I think it's important to listen to mothers um, and health professionals that know, you know, what's needed. And um, because there was probably a time that I would have thought that, you know, um, a couple of months to six months would have been, you know, fine. Um, but having, like I said, educated myself and in, in learning more and just being a grown person and, and being in this world more, you understand. Um, so I definitely am in favor of that. Um, I will also say in terms of, you know, supporting mothers um, and families, you know, certainly, you know, paid leave extensions that has to, that has to be the way that we go. I think that 12 weeks is definitely not enough for that. But um, I also think that there need to be some really good supports and systems for um, mothers, um, because we know that early on there can be very, um, this can be traumatic and how they relate and how they bond with their child can have devastating consequences. You know, when people are, when women are pregnant, you know, you're having very high rates of domestic violence um, um, incidences. Um, you also have high mortality, you know, rates that are going up. And so I really think that there might even be a classification for you know, pregnant women as being vulnerable and not to say that they're special needs, but that you know, there has to be some special attention paid to what um, women are going through. Um, and if you can't pay your way out of these issues, you know, even Serena Williams and you know, Beyonce. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. sorry. Um, just a quick reminder to candidates, um, just to make sure that everyone gets the same amount of time. Um, we're trying to keep answers to a minute and a half. I apologize. Sorry, that's all right. I didn't see the sign. Sorry. Um, 
Uh, we're going to move on to the next question. Uh, we know that good vision care is a critical part of increasing one's quality of life and being able to stay in or re-enter the workforce is essential to obtaining and maintaining employment. Do you support providing vision coverage for adults in, on Medicaid? We're going to start with Kaylee Young. Uh, I'll be short. I have quite frankly never understood why vision and dental aren't part of healthcare. Um, your eyes are part of your body, so are your teeth. Uh, we got dental passed last year. Let's get vision. Um, you need to be able to see to do anything. Eye doctors provide you with wellness to make sure that your eyes are okay. They can also catch things like generative diseases, glaucoma, cataracts, things that you can catch early on through regular wellness exams. Um, that you can't get if you just go when you think you need glasses. So it doesn't make sense for me. I absolutely support providing vision coverage. Thank you, Kayla. Uh, next same question going to Kathy. I'm going to behave this time. I'm so sorry. I just had everything so tiny before I can see those words. Um, but definitely, I think that it should be expanded. You know, I know as a young person, you know, sitting in class and not being able to see, you know, how that was so difficult. And then also, if you're over 40 years old, you've had that moment where one night you go to sleep with completely great vision and the next day you wake up and you're like, I need reading glasses because you can't see the back of a pill bottle. So I definitely feel like, you know, vision care is definitely something that should be part of a whole body treatment and something that should be um, afforded to folks in terms of insurances with Medicaid. Um, you know, it's very difficult, you know, when we go to doctors for colds and different things, we, those things happen all the time. And I will speak from experience. There was a time that I had a seven year stretch without a change in my prescription. However, in one year it changed twice. So knowing that, you know, um, the impact that it had for me in terms of my ability and uh, my qual quality of life and how I was able to write and read and do those things is very important. And so I totally support that and, um, and I'm just in favor. Thank you, Kathy. Next from Rusty. Yeah, I think both of those answers summed it up perfectly. Uh, again, uh, to to echo Kayla's comments, it's never made any sense to me that vision and dental are separate from from your general health insurance. I know that when I finished my last chemo treatment, one of the things they said they were like, "You need to go and get your eyes checked, and you need to make a dental appointment immediately um, because the chemotherapy does such a number on your gums and, and to your eyes." And I couldn't afford it. I couldn't afford to go to the eye doctor. I had just finished, you know, um, almost a year's worth of aggressive treatments. And I was pretty much bankrupt and I just couldn't afford to do it. So luckily, um, HealthRight ended up putting on a clinic um, through WVU and I was able to go there and get my eyes checked and get glasses. But it was really a struggle to make that happen. And, um, you know, I absolutely support um, Medicaid covering vision. And it's, it's a no brainer to me. Thank you, Rusty. Um, so we have our final question here for the West Virginia House of Delegates candidates. Um, we know that people of color are more likely to suffer from heart disease, diabetes, postpartum death, and many other conditions. What would you do to address these structural inequalities and improve health income outcomes for people of color? We're going to start with Kathy. On mute, Kathy. There we go again. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, you know, one of the things that um, I have to applaud is the NAACP, um, Reverend Watts, and the Tuesday Morning Group because they've been really leading um, on this issue for a while. I've participated in those discussions over the years, and I certainly co-sign um, that movement. You know, when we look at, you know, West Virginia as a lower wealth state, you have that, but then you add to that the context and the intersectionality of race, um, and it can be amplified. So, you know, looking at structural equality, inequalities in terms of geography, in terms of access, equal access to jobs, um, equal access to healthcare, um, equal access to whole foods and produce, I think those are things that we need to really pay attention to. Um, and so I'm all for that. I think that, you know, when we look at the Herb Henderson Office of Minority Affairs, um, even during the COVID crisis, you know, they tried to amplify their response and meet the needs of individuals that were experiencing um, disproportionate outcomes, African Americans, disproportionate outcomes um, with the COVID. And so, you know, there has to be certain and special attention paid to these communities because of the tendency to have these preconditions of diabetes, blood pressure, 
um, and things that can be monitored and maintained. Thank you, Kathy. And we're going to hear from Rusty. Again, you know, um, it all comes back down to priorities. And I think that legislators are going to have, we're going to have to elect folks that will prioritize the health and well being of all of West Virginians. You know, um, this isn't just a health care issue. We've got a lot of problems with inequality across the board. Um, I've been advocating for cannabis reform in West Virginia for the better part of a decade. And my main reasoning behind it, um, I'm trying to end the racist prohibition of cannabis. And one of the things that I've heard from lawmakers on both sides of the aisle when I start talking about the racial disparities uh, within nonviolent arrests and all that, they say, we don't want to, don't talk about that, Rusty. Uh, talk about the economics. The, don't talk about the social, uh, the social implications of this. And to me, you know, that's just, that's backwards. It makes me sick that that's the mentality that I'm, you know, I'm being met with by folks that were elected to represent all of us. Um, I think that we're going to have to focus on preventative measures, you know, uh, making the telehealth through Medicaid, we're going to have to make that permanent. Uh, so people have access to, um, to seeing the doctor before the conditions get so bad that, you know, they're going to have to go to the hospital or emergency room. Um, but we're going to have to prioritize again our people. I keep using that word, but priorities. This is what this election's all about. You know, we've sent folks to, to Charleston and to DC for so long that, um, you know, have prioritized the bottom line profits of their campaign contributors. And we need to send people that will prioritize our people. Thank you, Rusty. And uh, thank you to all three of our uh, West Virginia House of Delegates candidates uh, for participating tonight. Uh, again, we heard from um, Kayla Young, we heard from Kathy Ferguson, we heard from Rusty Williams, all running for House District 35. Um, now we're going to transition um, and talk to a Democratic candidate for Attorney, Attorney General Sam Petzoff. Um, so Sam, if you're ready, I have a first question for you. It's actually the same question. Um, uh, we know that people of color are more likely to suffer from heart disease, diabetes, postpartum death, and many other conditions. Over the past year, people of color are three times as likely to die from COVID-19 as white people. What would you do to address these structural inequalities, improve health outcomes for people of color? Oh, it looks like we may have, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I messed up on two different ways, excuse me, we have, we've missed, uh, Sam is missing and I missed Kayla. I'm so sorry, Kayla, could you please, if you could answer that question. You were doing so good, it's fine. <laughs> um, I agree with everything my friends Rusty and Kathy said, it's fine. Maybe Sam will hop back on. Um, I agree that we need to ensure that everybody has equal opportunity. And um, like Kathy said, there's a really great group of folks who've been working on this stuff for several years. And I take their lead in this entire. Uh, I think we also need to make sure that we're addressing implicit biases within the systems, making sure that our providers are know what implicit bias is and that we're working on that. And like someone said earlier, um, exposure to pollutants, environmental racism is absolutely real. And it's something that we haven't really addressed where all of our um, large facilities are and who they're next to. And so I think that's a huge part of it. Um, I love the idea of teams and conferences and studies and all that stuff, but it seems like we, we get a lot of those going and they never seem to end or really come to any sort of conclusion. So I think we need to work on those teams of collecting data and doing all that so that we're enacting real change as soon as we possibly can, because there's a lot of stuff that we can do right now to start enacting these changes. Um, something that is really interesting to me is medical research because the way uh, that the breakdowns of medical research goes is it's typically only, um, they're only researching white men. So even anybody, they're not being studied. So we don't know health outcomes by gender or color really. So it's, it's imperative for me to do that from a research perspective. So yeah, we absolutely need to address the inequalities. Thank you, Kayla, so much for your thoughtful response. I apologize again. Um, uh, we got Sam Petzong back on, so we're going to transition to our questions for Attorney General. Um, uh, Sam, we have the same question for you, which I'll repeat. We know that people of color are more likely to suffer from heart disease, diabetes, postpartum death, and many other conditions. 
Over the past year, people of color were three times as likely to die from COVID-19 as white people. What would you do to address these structural inequalities and improve health outcomes for people of color? <clears throat> well, thank you. Um, first of all, systemic level, we've got to protect the federal health care laws. You know, I worked for Senator Byrd when we enacted the Affordable Care Act. I was involved in, in writing the part that relates to the Black Lung Program in West Virginia here. We've got to fight to defend that law, to improve it, to build out from it, but we cannot afford to lose it. So that always point number one for me, 200,000 West Virginians, most of them working West Virginians, uh, will lose their health care if, if that health federal law uh, elapses. But then more, uh, moreover, you know, maybe you don't. The, many people seem to have forgotten that we have a civil rights division in West Virginia. We have a, a, a within the office of the attorney general, uh, we should be going after insurance inequities and housing inequities and, uh, uh, you know, structural and systemic racism across our state uh, using the Human Rights Act and the attorney general's civil rights division. I am very committed to that work. I believe in it, not simply for uh, people of color, but people with disabilities who are excluded on a systemic basis from uh, insurance and opportunity. So I believe in restoring. I'm going to bring back the Civil Rights Division to do the job that it's there to do. And uh, we need to acknowledge the state has real liabilities and obligations, legal duties itself in this regard and ensuring, uh, you know, the, uh, 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 ensuring against uh, disparate outcomes on uh, health metrics. Thank you, Sam. Um, for your second question, uh, Medicaid provides health coverage for over 500,000 people in West Virginia. That's nearly 30% of our state population. That data is from 2017. In the face of West Virginia's budget shortfalls from COVID-19, how will you stand up to defend Medicaid and our health care wins from last year? Those wins including dental coverage for adults on Medicaid, continuing to fund the IDD waiver waiting list, and uh, et cetera. <laughs> Well, well, you know, I think that the state has an obligation. The state is not like a, a, a private corporation. The state has an obligation to stand up and frankly acknowledge to the public when the state itself carries legal liabilities to the public. And when you're talking about taking away or defunding um, benefits, uh, you know, that you're, you're talking about turf where the state has to frankly acknowledge its liabilities to its own people. And, you know, um, through the Michael T case and, and many times over the years, the state has been on the receiving end of litigation regarding IDD waiver and Medicaid. And so uh, we're going to uh, be honest in defending those laws by uh, advising the state of its real liabilities to its own citizens. And uh, so I, I look for uh, the bar and the legal community to tell the state when it's time to answer for our uh, obligations uh, if, the st if the legislature, uh, and, and you know, God willing, they won't, but if the legislature tries to uh, give short uh, shrift or to shortchange um, dental coverage or, or tinker with it, we need to look hard at uh, where our, our courts would direct us. And, and, and my job as the attorney general would be to represent the state of West Virginia in answering uh, for that. Thank you, Sam. Um, I have one final question for you. The U.S. Supreme Court is going to hear testimony right after the election in California v. Texas, which is seeking to overturn the Affordable Care Act. Currently, West Virginia is signed on in support of this lawsuit. Do you think the state of West Virginia should be involved in a lawsuit that will take health care away from people during a pandemic? Well, I make my opinion on that subject uh, very public every single hour of every single day. We are spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to convey that very message to, you know, uh, millions of or nearly two million West Virginians. And of course, we have to save this uh, federal health care law. I, I don't think it's a perfect law. I think it has real flaws. But let me uh, depart with one reminder to everyone here tonight. West Virginia has not only under Patrick Morris uh, attacked the, this federal health care law, and believe me, uh, and let's remind people, he wants to eliminate all of it. He's not just going after the individual mandate. He's going after the Black Lung Amendments. He's going after the uh, subsidy structure. He's going after Medicaid expansion, which gives uh, state medical cards to working West Virginians, over 179,000 of them right now today. But, but the last thing I want to remind people under the ACA, 
we are one of only three states in the country that has elected to forfeit the full value of the federal tax credit. And this is a matter of healthcare policy that many people watching here may follow. It's a decision between what they call broad loading and silver loading. And, and I've spoken with many of you and, and Renata and Ted and people I respect in this community uh, and, and a lot of doctors around this state and the medical uh, community have concurred and have agreed with me. West Virginia has left probably millions, uh, tens of millions, if not hundreds, on the table by mismanaging our individual health insurance marketplace under the ACA so that we, we do not receive the full value of the federal tax credit. And our healthcare marketplace is susceptible to attack, and Morrissey is attacking it, because he himself has failed to, uh, to draw down the full value of the federal dollars that could have made health insurance cheaper or free under almost all the bronze, uh, the, under the bronze and the, and the, uh, the gold plans and, and even more affordable under the silver plans under the ACA. So Morris, he's not only attacking health care in his lawsuit against the ACA, he has actively mismanaged the marketplace, causing health insurance to skyrocket in cost for many working West Virginians. I'm going to get us right on that. I'm going to tell the governor uh, how to do things better. And, um, you know, the ACA gives us some of the tools to do that. Our state has unilaterally disarmed and made health insurance more expensive for West Virginia. I will not stand for that. And I, I hope you all uh, stick with me. Sam for WV.com. Sam, F-O-R, WV.com. Help me to share this message. We're on the cusp of winning my race. And uh, I know with your help, we will do it. <laughs> Thank you for your thoughtful answer. Um, again, that's Sam Petzong, Democratic candidate for attorney general. Um, now, before we uh, transition on to our, the gubernatorial candidate that we have on today, um, just a reminder to candidates that we will be doing closing statements at the end of um, the of this if you want to stay on and make a statement at the end. Um, now we're going to transition. Um, we have gubernatorial candidate from the Mountain Party, Danny Lutz. Danny, the first question I have for you, how would you prioritize using funds provided to West Virginia by the CARES Act and other COVID-19 relief funds? Well, thank you. First question, uh, question on that is, how much of that money is going to remain by the time a new governor is inaugurated in January? And I'm going to do, offer something here that's going to help my friends who are running for the House of Delegates do their job, and they're going to need to help me. We need to have better communications in order to have a good health care system. For instance, we need to reorganize the Department of Military Affairs and Public Safety into a disaster preparedness organization. A telehealth network that has been spoken of before should reach every part of West Virginia, and I propose to have one clinic in, each, in the counties for every 5,000 residents to be operated 24-7 with two nurse practitioners. The telehealth links and the emergency radio contact will provide links with specialists for public safety, sociologists, nutritionists, psychologists, childhood and aging services, prenatal and postnatal providers uh, on whatever we need. We will create an inventory of materials, logistics, personnel, training, and services we have in the event of a pandemic or a disaster. Each community will create a new disaster preparedness plan for their own community. I propose a system of pollution control credit owned by the households of West Virginia to be sold to those discharge uh, to be sold to those discharging pollutants into West Virginia air, water, and soil. Money from selling these credits will provide incomes to the to West Virginia households. Corporations must take the responsibility for what they discharge into the environment. The goal of the plan is to assure that no person in West Virginia is more than 30 minutes from a hot meal, safe drinking water, or basic medical care. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. Um, the second question we have for you, what ideas do you have to make health care plans more available for people who don't currently qualify for Medicare or Medicaid? Okay, we've talked about that a little already. It all depends upon what the new U.S. Supreme Court does to the Affordable Care Act. And that is beyond my scope of control as governor. It also requires cooperation of the legislature to deal with this. Now, if I could play dictator instead of governor, if you'll indulge me on that, 
I would enact a national 1% transaction fee on all exchange-traded financial instruments and such. Of this money, $4 trillion of it would be allocated to fund Medicare for all Americans, no exceptions whatsoever. There will be no need then for Medicaid funds, and the states could eliminate those programs and devote them to other, med other medical care programs. Medicare will cover preventive health care, emergency health care, vision, dental, psychiatry, alternative therapies, prescription medicines, prosthetic devices, and nutrition, most important. Improper nutrition and the existence of food deserts, as we have here in West Virginia, are the roots of many health issues in West Virginia. Americans waste a tremendous amount of food each year. I just came back from an orchard the other day, and I saw over 1,400 bushels of apples lying on the ground that could be gathered and cleaned and eaten. And some of them are damaged. I could take a paring knife and cut away the damaged spots and use them in my Waldorf salad that I'm going to have in a few minutes. What the chief executive of West Virginia must make clear, must do, is be transparent. We can't play games with the money you referred to earlier. We've got to know what we have and what we're going to spend it on. As chief executive, I plan to communicate with the people of West Virginia and not hide from them. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. Um, next question we have for you. We know that people of color are more likely to suffer from heart disease, diabetes, postpartum death, and many other conditions. Over the past year, people of color are three times more likely to die from COVID-19 as white folks. What would you do to address these structural inequalities and improve health outcomes for people of color? This is what my program I just described about the cl one clinic for every 5,000 persons with telehealth links and such will do. It will offer preventive medicine, medical treatment for people who have all kinds of conditions. Adverse health outcomes are not restricted to ethnic groups, however. Ethnic groups do have specific maladies, such as Tay-Sachs disease, sickle cell anemia, and adverse reaction to drugs like hydrochloroquine. That's widely known among African Americans and Southern Mediterranean. Adopting a broadband communication program speaks for itself. Proper nutrition will prevent a lot of, of the maladies we face. For instance, there is a school that is located downwind from the rock wool plant in Jefferson County, and it will emit 44,000 grams of lead per year. Now, that is enough lead to cause learning disabilities in every child in America. We can't have that, yet the Department of Environmental Protection allows it. That is something else I would reorganize, would be the West Virginia Department of Environmental Protection, so that it is effective. Corporations causing pollution must be responsible for, the, for, what, for handling the pollutants that they create. There's no other way. Dilution is not the solution for pollution. 45% of West Virginia citizens do not work for one reason or another, and this burden falls especially hard on ethnic groups. That's why my, my pollution patrol credit program will add an extra fifteen to $20,000 a year to each West Virginia household. I hope I get a chance to talk about that in a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. Um, we have one final question for you. With West Virginians experiencing some of the poorest health outcomes in the nation, what do you feel can be done to improve the long-term health picture for West Virginia families? What would be your priority areas? Well, after establishing the uh, system of clinics and communication programs, I'd say clean up our environment. From before, I proposed the pollution credit control system to supplement the incomes of West Virginia households. And to discharge these pollutants, a firm must buy the credit for the best possible price from the household. The extra income 
will allow the households to purchase better food, better lifestyle, healthier, better housing, and adequate clothing to mitigate diseases and pandemics. My priorities remain the broadband communication system, nutrition and pollution control, and adequate food for all to, do, to eliminate these food deserts. West Virginia, well, something that Sam can address as, as Attorney General, poor West Virginians are being overcharged for what they buy at the box retailers using electronic scanners. Just yesterday, I was overcharged at the scanner for the purchases I made, and I had to call it to the attention of the, of the box retailer. What the scan, when the scanners were introduced years ago, the box retailers guaranteed one incorrectly priced item free to the customer and all others at the most advantageous price. Now, all they say is, we're sorry we were caught. Some of us call that stealing. Now, the point being, people on SNAP are losing part of their purchasing power because the box retailers won't charge fair prices. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. Um, so that is the final question that we have for our candidates this evening. Now we're going to take a moment to allow each candidate to two minutes um, to make a closing statement. We're going to start first with uh, Democratic candidate for House District 35, Kathy Ferguson. Thanks so much. Um, you know, like I said, there's a lot on the line this year in terms of this election. I hope that you all will consider my candidacy. You know, one of the things that I've been saying, you know, throughout my campaign is people first. Um, and actually even taking a step um, further in terms of, you know, an oath. I think that doctors have a Hippocratic oath um, of first do no harm. And I feel like that's what we should be doing as legislators. We should be advancing legislation that's beneficial for people and not promoting anything that will call any, cause any harm. Um, the things that I'm running on in terms of making sure that folks have basic needs met, food, water, clothing, shelter, but I've been remiss in not making sure that healthcare is a part of that because those are all fundamental rights. And these are all the things that people need in order to be whole in society. Um, so if you're um, envisioning a, a future for our children, if you're interested in the quality of care that folks will have going forward, if you are a person who believes that, um, uh, even if you aren't in the same type of maybe dire circumstances, but you relate and you understand that there are some people that are going through challenges in terms of their economic um, opportunities, in terms of you know um, implicit bias, I think what Kayla mentioned that before, and structural inequalities, then I'm asking that you consider me seriously as a candidate going forward. Um, like I said, you know everything that I do is for um, the people. I'm keeping them first and foremost in my mind and in my heart. Um, and we want to make sure that West Virginia is a place where we build better people overall. So uh, again, you can find me on the web at www.ferguson4delegate.com. You can find me on Facebook. I'm happy to have you all friend me um, and follow my page. And it's um, Kathy Ferguson for the people. Um, uh, I'm sure the health um, consortium here will make sure that you all have access to my telephone number and things of that nature. But I thank you all for your time. And like I said, um, there's a lot on, on, the, on the line this election. And I just hope that you consider progressive candidates like myself. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, next, we're going to hear a closing statement from Democratic candidate for House District 35, Rusty Williams. Thanks again for allowing me to participate in the discussion. This has been great. Um, one of the things that I was most looking forward to in this election was the ability to sit down with all of the candidates and talk about this, these issues in an open forum. And um, you know, COVID has thrown a monkey wrench into those plans. So I appreciate you all facilitating this this meeting digitally. And um, for the folks that are watching, I hope you. Um, I hope that you weren't only paying attention to, to the answers to the questions, but I hope you're also taking note of the candidates that showed up and are participating. You know, um, to me, it, it's, it says a lot, um, you know, just by being here and, and being willing to, to have these conversations. Now, one thing I can say, I've dedicated my entire life to uh, fighting to improve the, the healthcare situation of all West Virginians. And that's what I plan to do uh, in the future. It's been some of the most rewarding work that I've ever done. 
is proud to build the grassroots movement responsible for building the uh, for passing the West the team uh, for insulin affordability last year to pass legislation capping insulin monthly copays at $100. Um, you know, this is this is very important to me. And this is work that I plan to continue, um, you know, for whatever, whatever time I've got left on this floating space rock, I'm going to use it to fight for West Virginia patients. So again, thank you all for allowing me to participate in the conversation. Uh, you can find me online at rustywilliamswv.com or on all social media, um, Facebook, Rusty Williams for House on Instagram, Rusty Williams WV. And I'm open to any questions you may have feel free to reach out and I'll get back with you as quickly as I possibly can. But uh, thanks again for allowing me to participate. Thank you, Rusty. Uh, next, we're gonna hear from Democratic candidate House District 35, Kaylee Young. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much for putting this together and watching and taking time out of your day. I know we're all sick of Zoom, but since we can't come and see you face to face, this has been a great opportunity to talk about healthcare. Uh, like my friend said, it's great to sit and talk about the issues. Um, I'm just a regular person, kind of a weirdo, but I have a lot of fun. I've been advocating in the Capitol for a few years, uh, working on environmental rights, consumer protections, all sorts of stuff. So I've gotten to know the process pretty well. And I ran because I'd really like a seat at the table uh, I don't think we have very equal representation and I would love to bring a regular point of view to the legislature. So you can find me online at Kayla Young 4 WVFOR. I'll leave my phone number like everybody else is doing. I would love to chat if you have any questions. Um, all my marketing's orange, but I am a progressive Democrat if you have any questions about that either. So yeah, thanks for putting this together, guys. Thank you, Kayla. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Talk, uh, Democratic candidate for attorney general. We'll come back. Um, we're going to go real quick to um, Mountain Party can gubernatorial candidate Danny Lutz for your closing statement. Okay, well, again, thank you for hosting this event. And <clears throat> the reason I got into the race for governor, primarily, I'd like to see West Virginia come into the 21st century as a participating part of America's economy and infrastructure. We can't continue to do things as we have in the past. That's why when I started answering these questions, I was pleasantly surprised at how the health care issues dovetail with the seven points of my platform upon which I'm seeking the governorship. You heard me talk a lot about broadband and about nutrition and about pollution control, because all of these things, we have got to be able to communicate. There are doctor, there's a doctor somewhere in the world who can tell a clinician what to do to treat a particular patient. With telehealth and with effective broadband, we can be in touch with that doctor or that specialist. We've got to clean up our environment. West Virginia is a source of water for ourselves, the District of Columbia, and parts of 12 other states. We want clean drinking water, and so do they, and there's no reason not to do it. There's, we, we simply can't continue as we have been. I'm a two-time cancer survivor myself. If it wasn't for the VA system, I wouldn't be here right now speaking to you. And I have a sister who was just diagnosed with a massive lymphoma. However, the hospital in Ransom told her, oh, that lump is just something old people get. Well, if she had followed their recommendations, she wouldn't be living here now only because a neighbor bundled her up physically and hauled her off to a Maryland practitioner in the Maryland healthcare system is she getting the treatment she needs. We can't continue like this. And we have got to do something about the food desert that afflict West Virginia. It's terrible when a coal miner with black lung has to drive 50 miles just to get groceries. And as Sam was talking earlier, he had one of his children. No parent 
should ever have to decide, is my child $10 sick or $100,000 sick? No person anywhere, let alone West Virginia, should have to decide, should I buy groceries this week or a prescription? I thank you for your time as governor with Sam Petzonk as attorney general and three people here as delegates. Thank you so much. Thank you, Danny Lutz, uh, Mountain Party gubernatorial candidate. And once again, thank you to each and every candidate who participated today. Um, a reminder that we did invite um, every candidate who ran in these four races. Um, and thank you to those who did um, participate. Thank you for your willingness to fight for a healthier West Virginia. And um, to close the day, I'm going to pass it over to Lisa Deal for closing. Thank you, Hunter. You did a really great job moderating the uh, candid forum this evening. I also want to give a special thank you to all the candidates that participated uh, this evening, and also a special thank you to all of those out there who joined us. Um, our final candidate forum is next Monday, October 19th, again at 6 p.m. Uh, it will be held in Cabell County, so we'll be hearing from candidates in that area from that county. And I want to just mention a couple of things with respect to voting. Uh, tomorrow is the final day, uh, the final time to register to vote. So if you know anybody who is not registered to vote, please get them out there and get them registered. Um, the October 21st to the 31st is when early voting will uh, happen here in West Virginia. So make sure you have your ID with you, make sure you have your mask with you. October the 28th is the deadline to request an absentee ballot. So please mark that on your calendar. And of course, November 3rd is election day and here in West Virginia polls will be open from 6.30 in the morning till 7.30 in the evening. Again, bring your ID and bring your mask with you. Uh, in addition, November 3rd is also the deadline to mail in your ballots. So if you plan on mailing in your ballots, the deadline is election day, November the 3rd. Uh, with that, again, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us this evening and hope you all have a very nice evening. Bye-bye.